Welcome to another episode of Hollywood Kitchen. It is a sweltering summer down here in Los Angeles. I don't know about where everybody else is, but it's so hot. And so going through a lot of my uh, film history recipes, the Agnes Ayers cold chocolate mousse really jumped out at me as a great thing to make. So I am so lucky today to be joined by the great Donna Hill. Donna Hill is the author of Rudolph Valentino, The Silent Idol, is a silent film expert and a wonderful cook. And I know personally that she's a wonderful cook because I have been in her apartment and eaten dinner. So, thank you, Carrie. Donna, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. I apologize for the headset, um, but across the street, I mean, halfway down the block is a uh, one of the local Buddhist temples. And this weekend is their, or today is their uh, festival. And I can't remember what it's called, but um, they have um, a PA system. They do um, the Japanese drumming and also they do dancing and it gets very loud. So I'm trying, these are noise canceling. So hopefully you're not gonna hear them when they're rehearsing cause that's gonna probably start uh, very shortly. Okay, well, I've yeah, so. dealt with power outages, with internet outages, uh, so I just, I try to just roll with what happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. All right, well, this recipe that we're going to make today comes from a 1925 cookbook called Famous Re Favorite Recipes of Famous Women, and Donna, I really want to say you have been, like, had the patience of Job with me this week in answering my many questions, so I want to thank you and Fritzi Kramer of Movies Silently for making this recipe a while back on her excellent blog, Movies Silently, and giving a lot of notes on how to do it. Now, I want to start out, for those of you who don't know about Agnes Ayers, you're going to learn all about her today. Agnes Ayers was a silent film actress. She began in 1914 at the SNA Studios in Chicago as an extra. And then she, we'll talk about this more, but then she had a relationship with producer Jesse Lasky. She made several films for director Cecil B. DeMille, including The Affairs of Anatole and The Forbidden Fruit. But of course, the main reason most people know about her is she played Lady Diana Mayo in The Chic opposite Rudolph Valentino. So that was kind of her place in film history. So we're gonna talk about her life, her career, of course, lots and lots of Valentino and her chocolate mousse. So I'd like to go ahead and get the mousse out of the way first because Donna, I, I followed Fritzy's instructions this week and I think here's where I went wrong. Okay, I tried to pasteurize my own eggs and I tried to make Swiss meringue and I didn't know what I was doing. It looked easy enough as these things deceptively sometimes do but my mousse turned out to be my test bake about maybe this tall. It's not even maybe the, the height of like a fingernail. Yeah, that, that looks more like ganache than uh, mousse. The good part about it though, is it's really cold, it's really chocolatey and it is edible. So I'm not gonna chalk this up as an outright failure. I'm gonna chalk this up as simply an alternative to what I'd intended to make, <laughs> but. Yeah. Not to worry. Yeah, start by doing, um, getting the milk warmed up so you can uh, melt the chocolate because that needs to be okay. much cooler than I think Fritzy described okay. in her recipe. The ingredients we're gonna need, Fritzy warned us that this recipe makes huge amounts, so we're gonna half the recipe. So what I'm gonna start out with is listing off my ingredients. I've got four ounces of chocolate chunks here, one half cup of milk, one cup of heavy cream right here. And we're only gonna do two tablespoons of powdered sugar because this is what Donna felt would be much better for this recipe. We're gonna do, don't get mad at any, any foodies out there, but I am gonna do some Cool Whip variant instead of meringue due to my meringue difficulties. And then Donna has suggested adding one teaspoon of espresso powder, which Given that I'm a coffee lover, I am in full support of this this idea. Yeah, you don't you don't taste the coffee. It oh, just no, enhance. Okay. No, it just enhances the chocolate. That's still okay too. That's, mm -hmm. that's okay. So how do I get started, Donna? Walk me through. Like, okay, uh, start by warming up the milk. Okay, and this is just the regular milk, right? Yeah, just the regular milk. Okay. And um, okay. add the espresso powder. I'm gonna put the milk and espresso powder in the saucepan right here. And if you wanna add the, the powdered sugar, 
Okay. Uh, you can do that here as well. Okay, so we're gonna add powdered sugar, espresso powder, and milk. And then, you know, get that hot. Don't bring it to a boil, but, um, you know, get it where you start to see mm -hmm. bubbles on coming up on the side um, and the milk is steaming. This, uh, this stove top heater thingy takes a few minutes to kind of. Yeah, that's no, no worries. You can just um, let that go. Okay. All right. So we do that and then. And then once that gets hot, um, <laughs> pour it over the chocolate. Ah. And let it and let the chocolate sit for, you know, a minute or two and then you can start if you have a small whisk, um, whisk the chocolate and the milk together and it should homogenize into a dark mass. Well, my whisk isn't small. This is kind of That's that works. That's fine. You can yell, you can also use a fork. You know what I don't have this week that I think I need to have now is a thermometer to test the temperature of milk. Mm -hmm. I don't have a thermometer. Yeah, you can get an instant read or get a candy thermometer. Ah, okay. Great. And that's, you don't need to stir that. Just, okay. just let it warm up. Okay. Okay. Well, while this is warming up, we can talk about Agnes and start our discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, like most people, I first heard of Agnes when I saw the sheep. And that was my introduction to Agnes Ayers. I think that's pretty much everyone's introduction to her. Everyone's. And I love that on this episode, my worlds collide, my cooking world and my cemetery world, because Agnes Ayers is at Hollywood Forever. She's in the Calabarium, which I can't do on my daytime tours, but usually I do on the night tour that I do. Also, so many of her, as you know, so many of her collaborators and co-stars are at the cemetery, including Rudolph Valentino, Son of the Sheep co-star Carl Dane. Adolf Manju, who was Adolf in The Sheik. Is... Cecil B. DeMille, William DeMille, Victor Fleming, James Cruz, William Desmond Taylor, like a ton of people from her world are there. So mm -hmm. I kind of love that. It's that the, there's like this sense of community even in the afterlife possibly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I thought she and Valentino really had good chemistry in The Sheik. Um, I think they did too, although I, I think it's more evident in Son of the Sheik because in the flashback sequence in Son of the Sheik or in, in the, not in the flashback, but uh, where they play the, the older versions of Lady Diana and Ahmed, um, there's, there is an affection there that was quite real between the pair of them off screen. Um, and you can see it, you know, the, the, it's very sweet. Definitely. I just uh, saw it last night, actually. I'm on the advisory board of Retro Format, and it's a nonprofit. We screen silent films both on the internet and all over Los Angeles. And last night, we had a screening of The Son of the Sheik at the Historic Women's Club. So I was there volunteering and stayed for the film. Okay, my milk is starting to boil here a little bit. Is it, is it boiling or is it just, is it steaming? Um, there is steam. There is steam. Okay. All right. Yeah, I can actually see that. I think it looks like there is steam. Okay, pour that over your chocolate okay. and just let it sit. Because it's it's going to need to sit for um, at least a, a minute or two so it can start to melt the chocolate. Okay, so then I can unplug the hot plate, right? You don't need the hot plate anymore. I and have you, have you got an electric hand mixer? I do, but it's super, super loud. So I'm kind of wondering if I could just use a spoon or a whisk, will that be okay? Uh, it'll take you a lot longer to, cause you need to whip the cream. Oh, I need to whip the cream, you're right. Okay, then I will go get my uh, my hand mixer. So do I whip the cream right now? I, I, I would get it out of the way, yeah. Okay. Because, because once everything's ready to go, it'll come together quickly. Okay, okay. So I apologize, I'm never quite sure with my camera, but here is a wonderful still of Agnes and Rudy from The Sheik. And one of the reasons I love this still is the flaming lamps that are in this tent, which would have been a tremendous fire hazard, but it makes for a great movie still. Um, and Paramount really did a lot for um, trying to heighten the exoticism of the film at least by making the tent super opulent and um, dressing Agnes in kind in her silks and uh, little uh, balloon pants, etc. 
Um, Great. So I've got my one cup of heavy whipping cream. Okay. I'm going to pour this into my nice little world market mixing bowl here. Okay. And how long do you think I should beat the, the cream here? You beat it until it's whipped. Okay. Guys, I apologize in advance. This sucker is going to make a lot of noise. So I'll edit this out later before I put it up. But uh, all right, here we go. Yeah, I should have advised you to do this beforehand. Now, hopefully that uh, if anybody has any questions, they can uh, add them in the Facebook chat. I will uh, open up Facebook and see if I can get the live feed. Okay, I'll, I'm going to keep whipping this because it's yeah. You, you keep whipping. Hang on. Stay tuned, guys. Hang on a sec. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in. I'm glad to see that there are people uh, commenting on Facebook. And I agree, beat it until it's whipped. How's it looking? Okay, Donna, I'm pretty sure I've got this pretty well, pretty well whipped up here. Okay, put it in your fridge for right now. Okay, I gotta run down the hall. I know that sounds crazy, but I live in a 20s garden court bungalow and my fridge is down the hall. So. That's fine. I see that Danny has commented that Julia Child always whipped her, her uh, cream in a copper bowl. Uh, yes, she must have been strong as an ox. I think she also did her egg whites most, most particularly in a, in a copper bowl. I am a huge fan of Julia, so uh, I will always be glad to talk about her too, even though um, she uh, probably wasn't old enough to see the Sheik, because uh, I think she was what, born in 1912. Um, but she did grow up near there in Pasadena, as you, I'm sure you all know. Okay, so went down the hall, put that in the fridge. Okay, let's see. All right, now what is our next step? Okay, uh, take your spatula and um, stir your chocolate. And you may want to use your whisk or a fork at this point, just because it'll help mix it better. You don't really necessarily need the spatula at this point. What you want to do is get the milk and the chocolate all homogenized into one uh, uh, liquid mass. You'll see it. You'll see it gets darker as it mixes, and well, it smells good. Good. How's the bowl feel? Is it still hot? It's it's warm. That's why we describe it. It's yeah, because yeah, I, I let mine sit about 15 minutes or so um, just on the counter. And by the time I, you know, got the egg whites and the um, the cream folded in, it was it was cool. All right. So should we should we uh, just sit and let this cool down and chat more about Agnes? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. We have ample time. So Agnes was discovered in 1915. She became an extra basically at SNA and then she 
Gloria Swanson was also an extra SNA at the time. And then Agnes went on to New York. And then she met Jesse Lasky, the producer, who's also a Hollywood at Paramount Pictures. And they began an affair. He was married and had kids, but they had a relationship. And he helped advocate to get her cast in Demil movies. But I would argue she had talent and she was beautiful. She could have certainly, you know, held her own maybe without his help. But that's, I guess, neither here nor there. Uh, she made several films with DeMille, and I think she shines in them. I think she's talented. She's beautiful. She's certainly watchable. Yeah, I, I, I'm very fond of Forbidden Fruit. Yes, I love DeMille movies. I just think there's such an extravagance and a wildness to them. That is... there, there, there's a def, definite wacky quotient to, oh, to yeah. Cecil's films. Like bonkers would be the word I would use sometimes. Yeah, I mean, last last year at Porta None, um, they screened Forbidden Paradise with Conrad Nagel and Dorothy Dalton, who was also, um, I don't know if she's better known as, but is known as another Valentino co-star. They did Miranda the Lady Letty, but she was fabulous in Fool's Paradise. And that is a DeMille film I wish would get a DVD release because the print was beautiful and it is bonkers. And it also has Mildred Harris in it, who has suffered through history, I don't mean to veer off, but has suffered through history as only being recognized as Charlie Chaplin's first wife and, you know, who lost their, their son, you know, within days of him being born. Um, she was marvelous in this movie and she's quite a better actress and had a fairly decent career through the late twenties um, and deserves to be better known. And in Fool's Paradise, she was great. Absolutely great. Hollywood forever. And I think too, I think there are so many of these actresses that deserve a fresh look because once a label sticks to them as like, when I was first studying film history, this is when I was young, way younger and before the internet was a big thing. I, was, I would just read all these derisive derogatory things about Mary and Davy. So I kind of never gave her a second thought. Oh, Hearst Mistress, oh, whatever, you know. But then when I moved to Los Angeles in 2000, I got a chance to see a screening of show people. And I thought, well, it's that Mary and Dave. I'll check it out, whatever. And I went and I was like, this woman is fantastic. Holy crap, like why did I only think, because it was written everywhere that she was just the Hearst Mister. There is so much more to this person. She was oh, smart, she beautiful, talented. And hilariously funny. I mean, the, the only downside to Davies was that, you know, Hearst wanted her to be a more serious, actress in drama and yes she could do it but she really shone as a comedian and you know if you haven't seen one of her films like my favorite silent is the patsy uh but ben modell's recently released beverly of graustark is wonderful that is going to be at silence under the stars at the paramount ranch next month here in la so i will be there for that don't miss it it's it's a it's a wonderful film and it's got antonio moreno and it's it's a fun movie but I feel like there are so many of these women out there that they were always associated with whatever men they happen to have been involved with, or they kind of got these whatever labels stuck to them. And there's so much more to the story. Like, yeah. And, and sadly, you know, as in many cases, you know, we, we don't get the opportunity to reassess because their films don't exist or they're hard to, hard to see. Um, and while the chic is good fun, um, I think Agnes does better in, you know, the, the DeMille films, um, even even in Ten Commandments that she has a small part. Um, you know, the, the Sheik, I enjoy it, but it, it, it does have its problems. It Be does. I agree with you. Um, watching it, especially with a perspective of today, there's such a disturbing undercurrent through the movie oh, oh sure it, it, it's the it's the classic bad trope of you know woman falling in love with her rapist and no no go ahead i was thinking about this and there seem to be more contemporary parallels to that for example clark gable and a lot of the movies he made in the 30s, he was shoving women around and telling them what to do and like the way he treats Norma Shearer in A Free Soul. Very kind of similar concept in a way, you know? Yeah, unfortunate. But, is. you know, at least the film is tremendously watered down. It's not nearly as awful as the novel, 
which is really, really, really graphically bad um, on that front. But it was also the hottest novel of the of the year, and you know Paramount paid good money for it. And you know, as my poster behind me says, you know, uh, a, a lover with a heart as hot as the desert sands. Great tagline. Um, you know, it, it's a it can be a fun movie, but there's definitely things that one must put in, into perspective today. Because I know today there definitely is a sense of people wanting to ban or remove things that are offensive. But I think in our world today, it's really hard for people to have nuanced conversations. And like I always say on the tour, you know, history is complicated. It's nuanced. It's about context, you know, and there's so many things to kind of unpack when you talk about a star or a movie or something that might be really shocking to us today. There's definitely a lot of reasons why it was so popular in its time. Mm -hmm. And Valentino, I mean, he's electrifying. Like, I remember the very first time I saw a Valentino film, my first Valentino film was Blood and Sand. Same here. And I remember going home from school and calling my mom and being, Mom, oh my God, I saw this movie today. Like, I just, and I saw it on a huge screen in film school. I think it was like my freshman year or something. Anyway, but it just blew me. Hey, he is so sensual and just radiates animal magnetism and I just never seen anything like that before and I, I, I have to believe that those women at the time felt the exact same way. You know? I think so I mean if you look at the you know the letters that are in the fan magazines that were published um, you know he was as they as H.L. Mencken said catnip to women um, and I think a lot of this was in line with post World War One, uh, where women had—I don't want to say more freedom, but they were stretching their wings um, in, in the post-Victorian era and during Prohibition and the Jazz Age, the, uh, as they could stretch their wings and be more adventurous and being um, more sexually aware was a big deal. I mean, that was tremendous. And I think too, sexual topics were so, you just didn't discuss them or you certainly didn't in polite company as the saying went. And it seemed like Valentino expressed things. And I think they said it in the Kevin Brown documentary about the Hollywood series. He expressed things with his eyes that they dare not put in the words. And you can see that in the Sheik, as, as Kevin and David Gill did illustrate in the documentary. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like Gable or Marilyn Monroe, you know, Valentino they mary pickford they had this communication between the camera that in real life might have been unseen but on screen it's there so you know agnes was the lucky recipient the, ca the camera doesn't lie and i think it can mm -hmm. just pick up things that you know maybe you don't in person for sure yeah I heard somewhere, this is kind of off topic, but a story about Al Pacino and they were some of the people on the crew were complaining on The Godfather, he's not doing anything, he's just sitting there. And then when they started watching The Rushes, they realized, oh, he's doing plenty. Yeah. It's, it's subtle. And um, yeah, I think that that's to me what the power of silent film acting is, this, this ability to communicate volumes of emotion with you know, no words. Uh, and, and as you said, I mean, that, that also equated with Spencer Tracy, where, you know, or, and or Gary Cooper. Oh, you know, no. They said he's not doing anything. And then when they watched on screen, it was like it was all there. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. So she, after the son of, after the sheep, it seemed her career started really going downhill. By about 1923, she ended the affair with Jesse Lasky. I think she realized that he wasn't going to leave his wife and children. That was a dead end. And they, you can kind of see her career kind of go downhill. Well, she also got married mm -hmm. and she had a, um, had a child in 1925, I'm going to say, 
her daughter was born. Um, and uh, so she pretty much retired. I mean, her husband was a manager. He actually managed Valentino for a while, and he was also good friends, and they stayed good friends. Um, that uh, Valentin when Valentino was dating Pola Negri at that time, um, both he and Pola were godparents to their child. Um, so, and as it says in Son of the Sheik, you know, on that one famous title card that Agnes Ayers has, you know, consented to make an appearance in Son of the Sheik, uh, reprising her role as Lady Diana. Um, and that, you know, she made a few films after that. Um, and unfortunately, by the late 20s, uh, she and her husband had divorced. And it was not, you know, of course, it's not a happy divorce. And um, then with the crash, she, of course, you know, like so many others, lost money. And uh, with the advent of talkies, it, you know, it was hard to maintain a star, to be a star in the transition period. Oh, yeah. And I get asked sometimes at the tour, people go, how many, how, how can so many of these people have a tough time making the transition? And I, because there's a lot of them on the tour, and I always say, well, there's, there's a variety of reasons. Like, it's never just one thing, usually. It's, some of them are getting a little older in Hollywood's a very youth-driven place. Some of them, their voice didn't quite record. Some of them, I think there was an attitude in Hollywood of out with the old and in with the new. And there was this need for a new crop of younger, different, fresh faces. Fresh and faces and also Hollywood, you know, went completely off to the side by wanting to get stage stars who had established speaking voices, even though there were quite a few, you know, silent stars that got their start on the stage. You know, case in point, the Gish sisters, both of whom, you know, spent their early careers before they went to biograph films in 1912, uh, they were on the stage. And, you know, famously, Dorothy uh, made her first talkie uh, in the UK, and it's a lost film, unfortunately. Her co-star was Charles Lawton, and it was a film called Wolves. And she had such an unpleasant experience making a talkie that she quit films and went back on stage for pretty much the rest of her career, only coming back to Hollywood in the 40s to make a couple of films um, and did some television in the 50s, but pretty much her film career was done. And film wasn't for everybody. Some people just prefer the stage. They preferred, you know, other methods of, um, you know, artistic expression. And that's, that's also kind of not uncommon. No, no, it's not uncommon. And case in point, I mean, there were the Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontaine, you know, made The Guardsman in 1932. And, you know, famous play that they performed on stage. Um, and as talky and as fun as the film can be, I mean, granted, it's probably been 20 years, more than 20 years since I've seen it. Um, and I remember enjoying it when I saw it, but they didn't translate to film. And not everybody does. It's it's really kind of a, an alchemy or a magic almost that makes certain people are just stars and certain people are not, no matter even if they are very talented. Yeah, I mean, my own personal um, weirdness, I don't like Helen Hayes in her MGM years, you know, Sin of Madeline Cladell and all of that stuff, even, um, oh, the movie with Gary Cooper that I'm spacing on the uh, Farewell to Arms. Yes, um, yes. She doesn't do it for me. When she's an old lady from, you know, the late 50s from Anastasia on, I love her on screen. But in the 30s, she's just, sorry, Helen, dead to me. <laughs> I, kind of, I see what you mean, though, because, like, I've seen some stars from the silent era, for example, and I'll think, like, or not even just the silent era, but some stars, you think, okay, they're okay. They're all right. They're pretty. They're fun. Okay. You know, but then you see others and you're like, okay, that's a star. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, with all due respect to the Talmadge sisters, I know they have their fans and I respect that. But like, I've seen a few Connie Talmadge movies and she's cute. She's fun. She's perfectly delightful. But then you watch a Clara Bow movie and you're like, okay, now there's a big difference here. You know? Mm -hmm. it's just I can't put my finger on it, but what makes one person a superstar and the other person just maybe a working actress or a star, but not in the same stratosphere, if that, yeah. if that makes you know, sense. Yeah. And also, there's an interesting book I read that has a chapter on Agnes. It's by Michael Anchorage. It's called 
dangerous curves atop Hollywood Hills. And it profiles 14 different women, their lives, their careers, and misfortunes of girls on the silent screen. And it's always interesting for me to kind of read stories of some of the lesser knowns because for every Gloria Swanson, Clara Bow, or Mary Pickford, there were so many women, as we know, that maybe had a couple years of success or got really, really close to being a superstar. And then for whatever the reason, for fate, for self-destruction, for illness, for tragedy, for whatever the reason, it just didn't work out. And it's kind of interesting to me, it's almost just as interesting to read those stories mm -hmm. as it is to read the ones who went on to become superstars. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the silent era is filled with incredible stories of people um, who had, you know, as you say, a, a great couple of years. I mean, Nita Naldi is a case in point. I mean, you know, her, her, essentially her career was, her good career was three years, from, you know, although she started making films on the East Coast about 1920, uh, it was with Blood and Sand that she really, you know, blew up and she's great. I mean, she's, as far as I'm concerned, she steals the movie from Valentino completely as Donia's Hall. But by 1925, you know, her career was essentially over because while she was, could be popular, she wasn't a star. And because she was typecast as a vamp, like Barbara Lamar and others, how far could she go with that? And, you know, happily Nita didn't need that kind of recognition. She, she went back to New York and, you know, went on stage, um, didn't have a lot of financial success because of course, like so many others, she, you know, was wiped out in the crash and she had married a um, older man who wasn't a one-time millionaire, but, you know, he lost his money in the crash. They went bankrupt in 1933, 34, um, but she managed to eke out a living, you know, and not live well, but she lived okay in New York and, you know, never lost her sense of humor. She's one of the few stars that I wish to God I had been able to meet. I, she, would, she would have been a hoot because her letters that survive are hilarious. And well, you know, her financial struggles were real and she did often, you know, ask friends for assistance. She never lost her sense of humor about it. Has anyone ever written a book about her? Because I would read that in like a heartbeat if they did. Nobody has, um, and not to toot my own horn, but um, Chris Connolly and our friend Joan Myers and I, you know, put together Nita's website and we mined pretty much everything that was out there and we got the approval of Nita's surviving family. And um, they were very happy with what we did. And I think you know, what we have out there is pretty much the best you can do. Right. So I, I just don't think there is enough to do a book. There's enough to do a chapter. But Valentino's women or Valentino's yeah. sorry. But, uh, you know, we put it all out there. It's all out there for free. And, uh, you know, if anybody wants to read up on her, it's neatanaldi.com, all one word. And, uh, you know, I, I update it every now and then as I get a new photo every now and then I'll pick up something new. One thing I like about Nita, I know we're getting way off the topic of Agnes Ayers, but that's okay. We're still swimming in the same pool and that's that's a great pool to be in. But one thing I like about Nita Naldi is as a vintage clothing collector and an art deco file, we are often told that the ideal standard of beauty in the 1920s was very boyish and very flat chested, kind of like St. Louis books, for example. And it's frustrating when you like those clothes and you like that era, but that is not your body type. And you feel like, oh, I guess there's no place for me. I guess I don't fit into this. And then when I saw Nita Naldi in Blood and Sin, I'm like, she is curvaceous. She has got boobs. She has got kids. She has got an incredible figure. And it doesn't conform to the conventional wisdom that every woman has to be a certain type. This is true. However, if you read the fan magazines and the newspaper articles and the uh, reviews of the films, she was taken to task for being, you know, curvy and uh, Juno-esque as the term they would use. Um, you know, personally, I'm okay with it, you know, being more than Juno-esque myself. Um, but it, 
to be a young flapper, of course, it was the, the boyish flat chested, you know, yeah. so, your, so your fringe hangs straight kind of body. Um, and, and Agnes certainly was not of that type either. She was, you know, more curvaceous than uh, say, you know, May McAvoy. Definitely. Like um, when we do our retro format um, internet screenings, sometimes I've moderated some of the comments and one person got on there one night and made some nasty comment about one of the actress's figures. And I said, look, women have existed in every shape, size and body type since the beginning. So do not criticize. Like I kind of took the person to task for having that sort of attitude. And, you know, even in the Agnes Ayers chapter in Michael Ingrich's book, they talk about they say one of the production companies let her go because she hadn't maintained her appearance or they accused her of gaining weight or you know something like that so i think this kind of rigid adherence to a certain body type has been foisted on women like i don't know since forever mm -hmm. and it's just so i i feel like it's so wrong-headed and so terrible and i'm really hoping that that ends i mean i think we're working on it but I yeah, it, it, it's a it's a constant problem, and body shaming on either side is is not pleasant. It's not, and um, there's so much more to people than you know. Like I always say, mm -hmm. I'm a tourist. There's so much more to someone than how they look or how pretty they are or not pretty. I mean, there's there's a human, there's a soul, there's a person in mm -hmm. there, and that is always worth looking to. You know, as people are so much more than just what's on the, of course, the outside. Yeah. But it's got to be hard for these women, both past and present, to constantly be under that sort of intense criticism. Ah, I see uh, Crystal Lawler's mentioning, yeah, a curvy girl, I love it. Yeah, and I like to see women in different movies that, again, have different body shapes, types. It's a good thing. You know? mm -hmm. We're all different, and then why not celebrate that? Why not celebrate diversity of everything, everyone? Right. You know? I think that's a much better way to go. Mm -hmm. So how's your chocolate feeling there? Okay. Is it, is it cool? See. Is it cool? Oh, it's totally cool now. Okay. okay. Uh, since you're going to do the Cool Whip thing, mm -hmm. I would start with do, using the cool folding it um, in the Cool Whip. You need a a bigger bowl. Your I bigger bowl. bowl. Where's my mixing bowl? Hold on. Oh, it's in the fridge. Oh, it's in the fridge. That's right. Can I go get my mixing bowl now? Go get your mixing bowl and go okay. get your uh, Cool Whip or Be whatever right you're. Guys. Sorry. It's what happens when your fridge is down the hall. <laughs> and just for reference, here is Agnes and Rudy in Son of the Sheik. I don't know if you can see that. Um, she's a little bit, uh, I would say, post-pregnancy, but she doesn't look um, all that matronly. And um, their their friendship, uh, you know, they while they only made those two two films together, they had a fast friendship, and that's lovely. Okay, so is that your whipped cream there? Yes, I want to ask you about the art of folding because much like close up my cemetery cat, my patience level is about that. And I tend to get all excited mm -hmm. when I cook and I start pouring everything in at once and go nuts. And that's not what folding is. Yeah, so how, how much cream have you got in there? How, do, how does it look? Is it about, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, it looks it's like a cup, but it's fluffy. Okay. Um, do me a favor right now, pour, pour that cream into your saucepan because you want to start with the chocolate in the bottom. So pour this cream, this whipped cream into, into the, the saucepan. saucepan. Yeah, just, just to get it into another container for right now. Okay, but by the way, the saucepan is not on, the heat is that, on. No, you don't want it on. I'm just, okay. it's just a vehicle to hold it right now until you get your chocolate in the big bowl. Okay. Okay, get all your chocolate mixture in the big bowl. Okay, because it's going to be more stable, I would start with some of the Cool Whip. So, um, and you're, I would say you're probably going to use half, if not that entire container. Don't go by the measurements that the recipe calls for because it's, it's all subjective. Okay. So put a couple of big scoops in there. And again, I tried to make the meringue. I just, I find meringue pretty difficult. So. Not, a problem. not a problem. That's I think that's why God invented Cool Whip. Okay, that's that's plenty. Okay. So what you're what you're going to do at this point now is you're going to take your spatula, and you're going to circle 
around the edge and then go up through the middle, but um, flatten your scoop, uh, excuse me, flatten the spatula so that um, when you're folding, you're pulling stuff up from the bottom and you're mixing it. Is the cool, the cool, the cool whip is, yeah, and you can be a little bit rough with this because I think the cool whip is going to be stable enough that it's not going to, you know, deflate too much. Fritzy warned me privately on Twitter that um, that meringue can be very, very testy too, and it can fall easily. So it, can, she, it can be. She did. She did caution me on this. Um, now, is it a full circle or a half circle? Um, I usually go around halfway, and then you pull when it gets to right there in the center. Then you pull it through back to the back side. Um, it's hard to explain while you're doing it. Um, and as, as you do it, you can turn your bowl. No, I mean, rotate your bowl. So take your bowl and just turn it a little bit each way. OK, how's it looking inside? Is it starting to mix? Um, it's starting to mix. It's a little bit lumpy in certain places. That's OK. OK, yeah. now, now I would say go ahead and you can put your cream in there. And you're going to keep doing the same thing. OK, all of the cream? Yeah, just go ahead and dump all the cream in there. Oh, okay. It's it's gonna deflate uh, more than the Cool Whip, and just keep folding until it all mixes. Um, and you can be reasonably gentle with it because now the cream's gonna deflate somewhat. Um, but basically, what you want it to look like is you know a solid chocolate and not chocolatey with streaks in it. Yeah, the streaks are what I, I guess need to get out here. So. Yeah, but you don't want to be super rough with it because you will deflate all of the cream. But just, you know, keep doing it. And if you need to add more Cool Whip, go ahead. Because uh, when I made mine, I ended up using uh, more meringue than I thought I would. Okay. Um, so. But it should, should be when you're all said and done lightish in texture so that you will probably be able to pour it somewhat into your little ramekins. And instead of putting it in the big, because I originally got one of those tins with the buckle, I don't know. What yeah, the springform pan. Springform pans. But I think since I'm having this recipe that you, you mentioned the springform pan would be too big for this one. Yeah, I, I just poured mine into little Pyrex ramekins figuring single servings are just fine. Yeah. And I've got some modern and vintage ones. So I'll be pouring it into all sorts of little ramekins here. OK, how's it looking? OK, this is about how it looks right now. OK, that's looking pretty good. You might want to add just a little more cool up in there to lighten it up. OK. And then once, you, once you've got that all mixed, you can then put it into your ramekins and put it in the fridge or put it in the freezer. Or, or eat one on camera while we talk more about Agnes and Dee. <laughs> you might also want to stick your finger in there and taste it, make sure it's sweet enough to your liking. But I found that um, I typically don't like mousse uh, of this kind of variety, super sweet. Okay. Yeah, you're the one that's gonna eat it. Who cares? Mm. Very good. Yeah. Wow. Okay. 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 Cool. All right. So I've got these little cute vintage ramekins here. So I think I'm gonna try scooping it in this. Yeah, that looks like about the right texture. It looks I, I did find that um it didn't really set up because there isn't any, you know real superstructure to it um, in the fridge, but I found it a little bit more um, forgiving to be frozen. All right, and here's... Looks yummy. Looks yummy. All right, well, I think I'm going to eat one and quality control while we talk. Okay. About All right, let me go grab mine out of the freezer. I'll be right back. All right. By the way, guys, um, Donna Hill just, I have to brag about her. She's also an expert on Dorothy Gish and doing a lot of research on Dorothy. So if you have questions for Donna about Rudy, Dorothy, or anything, just leave them in the comments. I'm sure Donna would be happy to 
answer them. And I'm gonna be right back. I'm gonna get my garnish for my stuff here. I love raspberries, so I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna fill a few raspberries on top of mine. Check to see what questions we're getting in here. So Donna, I was thinking I would love to see some memorabilia too. Okay, hang on just a minute. Let me show off mine. Ooh, yummy. Let's see how it so we do a, a moose toast to Agnes and Rudy. To Agnes and Rudy. Mm. Mm. It's like frozen chocolate pudding. It's quite good. Mm, oh god. I love the raspberries on it. Mm -hmm. I have a little mint plant in my garden. I might bring in some mint and try that too as a garden. Mint and chocolate is a marriage made in heaven. Mm -hmm. All okay. right. I did take one thing off the wall, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see it, but here's my window card from Blood and Sand, which, uh, oh, sorry, it's always hard to figure out which direction I'm going. Um, most, most of the posters that I have up that are framed are. Um, too big to show off, um, but I do have, since we were talking about Son of the Sheik, this is a um, drawing that was done by my late roommate, uh, which I, I treasure, I need to get it framed. Ugh. Hang on, I just dropped a bunch of stuff on the floor. And I have to add, Donna has a really cute cat named Tango. How's Tango doing? Oh, she's in the sun right now in the living room, uh, being a lazy cat, which she's uh, 18 years old now and, you know, moving a lot slower than she was when she was a younger kitty because, of course, she's arthritic now, but she, as long as she has a good life, she's, she's still here with me. Hey, Tango has a really good life. <laughs> um, and here's one of the lobby cards from the Sheik that just has Agnes by herself in it. Yeah, I found a poster on the internet that, that basically gave Agnes top billing and then with Rudolph Valentino. Yes, yes, at, at that time, because he was only signed to a um, one picture contract when he made the Sheik after he had left Metro, when he had his um, snit about his salary, which, you know, Rightly so, he should have been making more than $350 a week after Four Horsemen. Oh, um, yeah. So he, he, you know, he left, didn't re-sign with Metro and signed a one picture deal to do the Sheik. He was not the first choice. The, initially they were going to have James Kirkwood play the Sheik. Um, and of course, after the Sheik, he, he got uh, an extended contract, but he did not get top billing until I think Blood and Sand. Blood and Sand was the first film that he had top billing as a star. Um, Gloria Swanson had agreed to have him let him have co-billing on Beyond the Rocks, and it, you know, was Gloria Swanson and Rudolph Valentino, or with Rudolph Valentino, I can't remember. Um, so in any case, she, she was the bigger star at Paramount at the time when they made The Sheik, so she got top billing. Wow. Um, and. I want to say this is one of the few films where she actually did have top billing. I mean, I know she made films with Wallace Reed, you know, Fairs of Anatole, and I think at least one other, because I don't have her filmography up in front of me. Um, and he was a huge star, Wallace Reed. Yeah, he was a huge star, huge star. Um, 
so you know but but the but the chic was a happy experience for the pair of them um i was looking for the photo in my binder it's in my book um there's a photo that one of the photos that i love it's everybody having lunch in one of the tents you know because they went to, up to um near oxnard um the beaches up there to uh film the sahara desert scenes um and you know the, the there are several behind the scenes shots of them, uh, but it was happy camping experience basically for everybody. And there's this giant tent where the, the main table has George Melford in the center, Walter Long, Agnes, um, Rudy, the, the set designer guy whose name I can't remember at the moment, um, all, all on this long table, all having lunch. And you can see behind them giant you know, pots of coffee and stew and whatever it was they were being served for lunch. So it, it, it seems like everybody had a good time making well, the film. Actors really bonded on movies in those days because mm -hmm. if you shot a location, you're way away from home in Hollywood. Yeah. It's sort of like a camping communal experience. You're probably so consumed by that experience. You're not dealing with your day-to-day -day normal, you know, life. And I bet a lot of stars really got, had a close bond while they were doing that. I, I think they enjoyed it. You know, it was not quite glamping, but you know, better than the average camping. Um, so, you know, and it, it's, it's a testament that they remained friends, you know, that they enjoyed it. Most of Valentino's co-stars seem to have really wonderful things to say about him. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems I like- I think they all got along. I mean, he, I, don't, I don't think he particularly suffered from delusions of grandeur or that he was too big for his britches, although, you know, there's a lot of bad press when, you know, he was, went out, when he went on strike um, and how influenced he may or may not have been by um, Natasha, who was more artistic and more sensitive to that kind of thing than he was. I mean, he wanted to please his wife and have her be part of his productions. And I can't blame him. She was a very talented designer, a woman way ahead of her time. I mean, if she'd been working today, you know, she would be applauded for all of her many, many talents and not perceived to be, you know, a controlling bitch is what, how she was perceived back in the 20s. Um, but back to the point, I mean, he, he was a nice, he was a nice guy. And he got along with his co-stars. He generally got along with, you know, his directors. Um, was he the greatest actor of the silent era? No. He rose and fall to the level of one, the material that he was given, and two, who he was directing, directed by. Case in point, George Melford in The Sheik. You know, Ru Rudy is a bit more, uh, less refined than, say, he was in Four Horsemen. Um, not that it's caricature, but it's, you know, the, the, the caricature of, you know, the popping of his eyes out and, you know, being more declaratory, so to say, um, that was much more refined. Say when he, by the time they got to make *Son of the Sheik*, with George Fitzmaurice, who was a you know better director than Melford, but I have to say I have give it to Melford. *Miranda the Lady Letty*, terrific little movie. It's a sleeper, and uh, you know I th actually think it's better than *The Sheik*. Um, and Rudy's certainly wonderful in it. So anyway, back to your point. Yeah, he got along with pretty much everybody. Um, very few, if any, stories of him that are negative, unless somebody had an axe to grind. But yeah. among among his co-stars, I mean, he was much loved. My my two favorite Valentino movies are Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse and The Eagle. Because mm -hmm. you've got not only Valentino, of course, but Rex Ingram and Four Horsemen. And then I believe Clarence Brown was the Eagle. Yes. And I, I love both those movies. And I think he mm -hmm. shines in both the material and under the hand of both those directors. Oh, sure. And he and Clarence Brown got along like a house on fire. You know, I'd like to think that they would have kept on working together because Clarence Brown guided Garbo, of course, in so many movies. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions people ask me sometimes on the tour, they say, well, what do you think would have happened? had he had he lived and you know to the sound era and you know there are some people according to the you know the kevin brownlow david gill series 
that said, oh, he would have gone the way of John Gilbert, that romantic idol would have been laughed at in sound. But I kind of wondered that if he had a director like Clarence Brown, if he had a studio that said, okay, let's keep him from sound for a while. Let's find the right script, the right director, very carefully cultivate this transition like they did with Garbo. I think he could have been fantastic with the code. He could have been, but I think the problem is with the coming of sound, and I think this was inherently the problem with John Gilbert, was that the style of the role that they were known for, and I think Valentino was very self-aware that his days being the romantic screen idol were limited. But by the time sound came in, and as early as 1930, out of fashion, because suddenly people were seeing, you know, like Gable a little bit later, you know, Cagney, Edward G. Robinson, it was an entirely different kind of leading man. And, yeah. you know, with the pre-code, the coming of the gangster films, grittier films, there really wasn't a spot for him. Although, as I've said before, my fantasy, he would have been great as Dracula. Not that I'm dissing Bela Lugosi, but my God, he would have been fabulous as Dracula. Um, because it would have been a really sexy Dracula, which is what Dracula is to me. Um, and, you know, by the time you get to the mid thirties, the, the foreign, the foreign lover is more the buffoon as in, um, oh God, not, not Alexander Darcy. Is that Alexander Darcy? In um, The Awful Truth with Irene Dunn as the music teacher, you know, or Eric Rhodes in um, Top Hat or The Gate of Orsay, you know. That's true. It kind of amazes me how much society and the world and the films changed from late silent era to early, you know, sound, early night, late 20s, early 30s. It was a huge transition. Yeah, a huge difference. I mean, you know, with the limitations of the camera being in a box in the early, early sound days, it made films much more stilted, plus the fact that Hollywood veered, okay, we're going to do plays and, you know, literally be talky until they found their voice um, and everyone adapted to, you know, having dialogue in films. You know, it was a different time. And, and of course, Valentino, he wanted to get himself behind the camera because he knew that he wasn't going to last as a, you know, screen idol. And he, and he loved to tinker and he wanted to be on the other side of the camera. Sadly, you know, that did, he didn't have the opportunity. Um, but on the plus side, you know, he's forever young and is still being discovered to this day by people who have, you know, not been bitten by the silent film bug, but like Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford and William S. Hart, you know, they, they will see a film and it was like, wow, you know, this is, this is something amazing. You know, and sometimes I talk to other uh, film historian colleagues of ours, Donna, and they kind of bemoan that kids today don't care about the past or film history or all this stuff, but I kind of disagree with them because I don't think these classic films are ever going to be commercial on the level of, say, Marvel comics or something. But doing my tour alone, I meet a lot of young people who do care about this stuff. I had a really young girl on my tour. She's 20 recently. And she showed up and had a homemade, like, designed Valentino shirt on. And my jaw just dropped. And she said how she and her dad drove out of town just to come take the tour and how excited she was to see Ruby. And I was like, this is why I got out of bed today. Thank you. It made me so happy to see a young person with that kind of devotion. And I thought, okay, this isn't going to die. This is going to keep going on after the all of us are gone. The audiences are smaller, definitely. Um, but happily, you know, while physical media, they keep saying it's dying, stuff keeps getting released. Um, I mean, the, the Sheik did come out on Blu-ray uh, via Paramount. Um, although I don't like the, the score. It's the, it's the same score that was on the, the old DVD and VHS when Paramount first released it. Um, I preferred... Uh, the one that Kino released, but that went out of print, unfortunately, because Paramount 
pulled the licensing, you know, away from Kino for any of the Paramount films, which, you know, they own them. Um, well, technically they own them, they're public domain now. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's the best out there. It's a nice print and, you know, it's available for people to see. And if you're lucky that you live in a reasonably good sized metropolitan area, you know, there are screenings every now and again. And of course, Turner Classic Movies. If you have cable and you have Turner, they will show them every now and then as well. And as I tell young people too, I say, look, when I was a kid, you had to hope it came on TV, eventually VHS, and even when VHS came out, you had a very limited selection of Casablanca, Don Gwen, you know, very few. And then now we've got streaming, like the Criterion channel is fantastic. A lot of really rare stuff comes up on YouTube. There are classic movies to be found on HBO Max. I mean, there are so many ways and avenues to see classic movies. Probably, I would argue, more so than there ever have been before. Yeah, I would say the, the variety has certainly expanded, although, you know, I'm older than you. When I was growing up, and this was well before cable, when you basically had the three networks, and then you had, like, the UHF stations, which would show old movies. I mean, that that was the only option that I had. You know, if I if I wanted to watch movies on TV, you know, on the UHF stations, they showed old movies. I mean, the local station here, one of them, uh, KTVU, which is Channel 2, uh, every Easter, my that's the, this is what I call my first silent film, was every Easter they would show King of Kings, the silent King of Kings. And so that's how I first got introduced to silent films. Um, but, you know, I didn't see Valentino until I was, what, 15 or 16 years old, because that's when PBS ran the, the silent series. And those were the first silent films that I saw. I think I saw them, if memory serves, uh, like freshman year of college or something. But yeah, when I was a kid, it, I do remember the playing three TV networks and a few others. Mm -hmm. And we had a TV network that would have the Sunday horror matinee. And I've said before on the show that that's where I, because before my birthday, when I was about five or six, I saw Bela Lugosi and Dracula. And that's why I'm sitting here today. Like that mm -hmm. is what started everything for me. And every Sunday they'd have a horror movie with commercials at like one o'clock. So when we got home from church and ate lunch, if I didn't fight with my brother that week, if I made good grades in school and behaved myself, I would get to watch the movie. And that was like my gateway drug into everything. And then cable and VHS came along. And then by college, it was like these, these big, um, what do they call those discs? I forget. Oh gosh. Um, laser disc. Laser disc. Yeah. Laser discs were a big thing when I was in college. And so I kind of feel like I've seen all these different kind of itinerations, but I just feel so lucky to be alive today when there are so many channels and streaming outlets and that I can go to San Francisco and see you and see silence and see them here in Los Angeles. Yeah. I never take that for granted. Like I feel very grateful that mm -hmm. I get those opportunities and I'm so grateful to TCM as well. They do such a good job of showing silent Sundays. They really always pick a silent star for their silence under the stars every summer. Like Have they got one this year? Um, I have to look at the schedule, to be honest, um, but I'm pretty sure they probably will. They usually always do have at least one silent star featured in the lineup. Take a look. But um, I just feel grateful that we have what we have today, for sure. Yeah, we're, we're all very lucky. Um, yeah. And it's, it's heartening to hear that, you know, young students or, or young kids are seeing films and that there is an interest. But that's one of my... Uh, little caveats or complaints about um, like Cinecon that, you know, the film schools are down in LA and they don't seem to promote at USC or UCLA and say, you know, we're having this festival, you know, come see this stuff. But, you know, I don't run, I don't run the world. So, okay, let me take a look and see who this is. Retro are. format, uh, one of the things that I feel so proud of at Retro Format is even before the pandemic and certainly during, we've have got a school here in Los Angeles that we do, I think it's for seven, sixth, seventh and eighth graders or something. And we do virtual silent film presentations and we have special guests. We've had Ron Chaney, Ron Chaney's great grandson. We've had uh, Harold Lloyd's granddaughter. 
and we show these silent films. We have discussions. Our musician Clifford Talick answers questions mm -hmm. and does all sorts of piano demonstrations. And one of my proudest moments of my life, it wasn't even me, of course, but I was sitting in and observing us doing a Halloween episode and we were showing not a full movie, but tons of clips of Lon Chaney with his grandson there. And this little boy showed up on Zoom and he had done all of his own monster makeup. And he was so excited for the episode. And I texted a fellow board member on the organization and I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, I would seriously like adopt that kid if his parents get tired of him because what a sweet kid that's so excited about this stuff and you know, so fascinated to see Lon Chaney. So we're kind of doing what we can to keep this alive and to get kids excited about these movies. And what goes my nephew? My nephew's 10 years old. And my whole thing is, even if he doesn't grow up to eat, sleep, drink, and breathe these things, mm -hmm. I do. if he just has an appreciation of it, if he can just go, oh, yeah, yeah, my, my weird aunt showed me some Buster Keaton once, it, as long as he kind of, it kind of enters his, his mental vocabulary in some way, you know, that's kind of all I can really ask for. I don't know why, but my Google is not letting me pull up somewhere under the stars, but I did see that they are showing Garbo and Gilbert Rowland is also a star. So I'm hoping that they're going to show at least a couple of his silence. Oh, definitely. But I really appreciate their dedication to silence. Even at the festival, they always do at least a handful of silence, hopefully most festivals as well. Right. So they've really, really shown their dedication to that for sure. And Donna, I have to plug your book because it's excellent. And you've been so generous educating me and so many other people about Valentino. This book is Donna's book, Rudolph Valentino, The Silent Idol. Let me go grab the updated version so they can see what the new cover looks like. Hang on a minute. Ah, okay, very good. And for those of you who have questions, uh, please send them in here on Facebook. Let's see. Let's see if they're popping up on my phone. I wish so many of you could come to my little apartment today and eat some of this uh, with me. There's a lot of it. Let's see. Laura Peterson Balo. I love Dorothy Gish, such an underrated performer, I agree. And um, yes, Danny, Donna does have a lot of silent movie posters. I stayed with her for a long weekend last summer in San Francisco. She lives in a gorgeous Art Deco apartment covered in Valentino stuff. So I was so happy. It was, it was glorious. Donna, can you show us the mineral lava trophy too? Sorry, it was in the other room, of course. Um, so the edition Carrie has is still in print, though it's harder to find. You'd have to order it uh, via the website at blurb.com. But here's the new edition. Um, it's expanded. And the uh, photos are larger, full, more full page. Ugh. Excellent. Um, it's 500 pages long, and uh, I'll uh, I'll post a link where you can order it directly. Because while it is available on Amazon, I have seen some complaints in Amazon reviews saying that um, there were some errors in printing, and it's easier if there is by chance an error in the printing that you can get you know, a replacement copy via the publisher rather than via Amazon, because Amazon, you know, it is distribution, but it doesn't um, guarantee that you're going to be able to, you know, get a replacement. So where is the best link for people to buy the book? Is it Amazon? Uh, no, not, a I would say okay. not Amazon. It's via Lulu. I'm going to um, get you there in just a minute. Sure. By the way, Laura Peterson Balo, who I have to, I have to, plug her. She wrote a terrific biography on um, Carl Dane, Valentino's co-star in Son of the Sheik. She commented, Donna, that Dorothy Gish is indeed a very underrated performer. Ah, I would agree. I love Dorothy and I am slowly working on Dorothy. Okay, I just posted a link in the in the chat there on Facebook. Um, and yes, I would agree. Dorothy, uh, and unfortunately, Dorothy is one that suffers like so many other silent stars, um, there are very few of her films that are available um, and even fewer that exist. Her, you know, her prime period between when she um, left Triangle and um, was making films 
for Paramount under the art craft banner between 1917 and 1920, almost none of those films exist, um, oh. including, you know, um, one called Out of Luck, uh, which I have the title card for in a binder, um, which co-starred Valentino. Uh, there are films I will never see that just if I think about that I will get so upset like it just drives me nuts you know yeah that's why when they found Beyond the Rocks I was so happy and rejoicing because I'm like oh please let there be more please and while I enjoy Beyond the Rocks um I wish an American print survived because I think it probably would be a little bit different than the the foreign negative um which they found but you know, I'm not look, not dissing a gift horse in the mouth. It's great that it exists. I just wish that we had the American version to compare. I mean, you know, we're, we're lucky that what little of the young Raja exists, exists. Um, although, you know, these films are, for me, what we've seen of them, you know, are, are a perfect illustration of why Valentino went on strike. Because he complained about how cheaply made they were. I mean, Beyond the Rocks is a perfect example. You look at the Alpine set, you know, it's painted mountains in the background. It, I mean, it couldn't be more obvious how cheaply it was done. And that I understand why Valentina was complaining. He's like a um, big star. Like, why weren't they giving him, like, the treatment he deserved? This, well, he, his stardom hadn't quite been proven yet. I mean, he wasn't the star that Gloria Swanson was, who could pretty much write her own check, uh, which is why, you know, she allowed Valentino to have billing. Um, she got a European vacation out of it. You know, she, she, she knew her worth and she was a smart businesswoman like Mary Pickford. And Valentino, as much as I love him, he was not a good businessman. He, you know, he certainly had his ego when it came to business but he didn't have the business smarts and he didn't often have people to advise him who were true, you know, people to advocate for him or he listened to the wrong people. Um, you know, not everyone can be a Pickford or a Fairbanks or a Gloria Swanson when it comes to business. But I would argue that most artists and creative types, at least me and a lot of people I know in the arts, they're just not wired that way, you know? Like, I think the Pickford Fairbanks are kind of, I would almost say maybe an exception as opposed to the rule. Because mm -hmm. you know, it's very rare. I've very rarely met people that are brilliant business people and great creatives, you know? Like, it seems people are kind of one or the other. I never met a ton of people that were, you know, really both. Yeah. Like, I, I revere that skill for sure. I'm certainly not a, a, a great business person, that's for sure. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I, I don't want to diss Rudy, but it, I mean, it's true. I mean, as a case in point, when he went on strike, um, you know, he lined up things that he wanted. And, you know, at that point, Lasky Paramount said, okay, we'll give you what you want. And then he said no, and he turned them down. Why? We don't know. I mean, he was he could be a hothead, um, but it was a stupid error because he pretty much, you know, that was two years of his career that he lost. And he was only a star, you know, for five years. That we lost. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's unfortunate, but that, that's what he did. I think so many of our lives, though, like, you look back and think, Oh God, if I'd known what I know now, several years ago, I would have done blank. I think a lot of us can probably say that. Like, it seems like a lot of things seemed like a good idea at that time, you know, but then with hindsight, you just shake your head and you think, oh man, if only I'd known. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Definitely. I mean, it's easy to, yeah, look back yeah. and and also, I, I feel like because of the pandemic, I almost feel like this renewed sense of even stronger sense of empathy for the people who went through sound and the Great Depression, simply because, not that I'm comparing the two because they're obviously different, but when something happens that causes tremendous upheaval in your life, you didn't see it coming, 
you didn't understand it at first, and then you find your whole life kind of overwhelmed or engulfed or changed because of this thing, whatever that thing is, I kind of feel like, yeah, that must have been kind of what some of them felt like. Sure. I mean, with the coming of sound, I mean, the entire industry was upended. And uh, it's not surprising that, you know, probably 80% of the people who were stars in the silent era failed in the 30s. I mean, unfortunately, there are stars like, you know, Nils Aster, who I love Nils Aster. And I still believe that after making The Bitter Tea of General Yen in 1934, he, sh he should have been on the ascent. And that was pretty much his last great role. And it's a tragedy because he's fantastic in that movie. Um, you know, but other stars, you know, like Corinne Griffith or Colleen Moore, you know, they, they married well, they, their money was invested well, or, you know, they, they didn't suffer that kind of difficulty. Um, but they seem to have a healthy understanding of who they were, very separate from the screen image. And so it didn't bother them as much. Um, like the Talmadge sisters, they were, you know, financially well off. And uh, as I think Con Constance is remembered as advising Norma saying, get out while you can. And I think some of them too, like, of course, Clara Bow is one of my favorites. Like, I just think that first off, the wild flapper carefree, while that was so celebrated in the 20s, almost overnight, that was seen as kind of unforgivable. It was out. And then I think her heart just wasn't in it. And she'd weathered so much scandal, so much stuff that she just lost the love of all of it. Yeah, well, um, I mean, Clara Bow, who was a tremendous star, she was abused on every level. I mean, you know, from when she was a kid, she was abused when she signed with B.P. Schulberg. I mean, she was put in picture after picture after picture after picture, and she was carrying those films once she became a star with, you know, very little good support, crappy scripts, crappy directors, and it was all based on her personality, which is wonderful. But she was burned out by the time she was, you know, 23, 24 years old. Can you blame her? Not at all. Um, and that, you know, her, her mental state was fragile because of all of the, you know, childhood abuse. I mean, God, let's talk about a Dickensian childhood. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but we have to revel in what we have that's left. I mean, I hope that at the end of her life, she did have some happiness, you know, and contentment and certainly she was self-aware that i mean her famous quotations about you know watching marilyn monroe become a star and how she empathized with monroe um so she she wasn't a stupid woman by any means not at all not at all um but the tragedies in her life you know that that overcame everything else uh, but you know we're blessed that we have films like it and um, manhandled that still exist man trap, man -trap sorry man -trap. Okay. dancing dancing mothers dancing mothers um, that still okay. exist that we can experience what a tremendous personality she was i was in san francisco silent one year and there was a line around the block in the castro to get into it and it got a standing ovation. And this is back in the day when the Castro had the organ. And so the organ rose up and people mm -hmm. just went nuts. And I just thought to myself, I hope that she knows. Like, I hope that she is looking down and going, wow, can't believe all these years later how much love, you know, there is. That would be nice, you know, a nice thing for all of the silent stars. because Because, you know, so many of them, did suffer in later years. I mean, even, you know, Mary Pickford. Oh, yeah. I mean, of course, with Pickford, I, th I think this is my speculation is that, you know, for her, it was so difficult when her mother died in 1928. And then, you know, Jack and Lottie dying not too far apart. I think what Jack was in 33 or 36, and Lottie was 33 or 36, can't, can't remember when they passed. The divorce from Fairbanks, I mean, it was uh, like a domino effect. Yeah, I mean, 
the the 10 years between you know 28 and 38 or 37 when she married buddy rogers I mean, terrible plus you know the coming of sound and uh, as much as i love her i think she won the one of the most unworthy best actress academy awards for coquette which was it's a terrible movie i think i think that was a she's done so much for this business she deserves this oh without question i mean without mary pickford the industry would not be what it was what it became at all um but you know the the tragedy of her life was that 10-year loss of everything had to have been extremely difficult and you know ultimately by the late 1950s and 60s you know became full-fledged an alcoholic and uh, and then you know after 1965 pretty much a recluse so we've been super stardom didn't save people from tragedy heartache suffering and problems sure sure i just love these stars so much and what i do have to plug one group uh, there's this group called the silent film cemetery project on facebook and one thing they do that really touches my heart is They've adopted obscure silent film stars all over Los Angeles and I think even like San Diego, and they clean and take care of their graves. And at Hollywood Forever alone, they have Florence Lawrence, Henry Lerman, Virginia Rapay, a lot of these stars, and they go and decorate the graves and they look, they've never looked better than they look lately. And so this kind of trend of really honoring and celebrating these people that time forgot, I think is, is so incredibly beautiful. Yeah, no, I, I've seen what they've done online and it's, it's, it's lovely. It's really nice to see because, yeah. you know, so many of these stars are forgotten. Oh, Carl Dane, they clean his great too. They are, and they don't deserve that. Like they really, they're just, they were, as, as Kevin Brownlow has said, they were artists, they were innovators, they were pioneers. They were at the ground level of a new art form and to kind of be thrown on the dustbin of history, if you'll pardon the cliche, I think it's mm. so sad. Like they deserve better than that. And and that's why I think um, it's great if if it's the only way you're going to get to see it is to see Brownlow's and David Gill's Hollywood series on YouTube, because it's not going to get reissued on DVD as much as we all would love it. But because one, they'd need to license the clips, even though you know 99% of the films are public domain at this point. You know copyright is still being enforced by Paramount or Warner Brothers or, you know, whoever owns the films um, or owned the films, uh, you know, depending on if copyright was renewed in the in the 40s. Um, it's great to see it on YouTube because you get to see some of the people that they interviewed and that alone. I mean, people like directors like Byron Haskin, who's not a well-known name, but he worked at Warner Brothers for decades and he did a lot of the special effects cinematography but he was also a director in the silent era and the joy to see them speak about this era which will never come back simpler times but just the the joy that they had in making these films and then to seek out the films um like this past may we got to see the fire brigade which if anybody has seen the first episode of Hollywood, it starts out with a, a Nickelodeon film of, 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 you know, a fire rescue that all of the cliches, you know, jerky, blurry, you know, looks primitive. And then you move forward to 1927 or 28, and you see the clips of the fire brigade. And, you know, as Kevin said, it is a programmer. It is a programmer. It was basically the silent era's version of a B-movie. You know, yeah, Charles Ray was the star, but he was well past his big star period. May McAvoy, you know, okay, she was in Ben-Hur, but again, not a big star. I don't think anybody, I don't think she ever carried a picture. But you look at the film, the quality of the way the film was made, the editing, it is a piece of art. And to, to have waited since 1981-ish to see this film, restored with the hand shegle, with the two color technicolor, with the tinting and toning. The last two reels were amazing. It was well worth waiting all that time to see that film. And if anybody's going to Cinecon this year, they're screening it. Don't miss it. Because and it was I, 
fabulous. I have to say that Hollywood, the pioneers documentary series in the early eighties from the tens television by Kevin Brownlow, and David Gill, that is a life changing series. It will really just light a fire under you if you have any interest in film history. Yeah. And I believe all 13 episodes are up on YouTube. It, Mm -hmm. under various accounts. When um, I first moved to LA in 2000, um, one of my first jobs was working at HBO. And back then we had a tape room, which we wouldn't have today. You know, I was in the tape room and the entire Hollywood Pioneer series on VHS was in there. And I was looking at it and the guy who ran the tape room goes, ah, no one wants that. We're going to toss it. And I was like, like hell you will. And I got my backpack and I put the whole series in my backpack and took it home. I still have it. Yeah, I, ha I have mine on um, DVDs that I recorded from a friend who has it on, who had it on Laserdisc. Oh, so wow. I ran it through the Laserdisc and burned it on DVD. I will never give them up. Oh, yeah. I still have my VHS ones, even though I don't have a VHS player anymore, because I'm like, I can't let that go. Yeah. So, Donna, do you have more memorabilia to show us? I know you have the Mineral Lava Trophy. Oh, I do. I have... Uh... I have also, I have a ticket to uh, see them. And this is um, the winner's trophy for the beauty contest from Baltimore. And I know the light in here, you can't see it, but it's presented by Mr. and Mrs. Rudolph Valentino to the winner of the Valentino Mineral Lava Beauty Contest, 1923. Um, and, and for those who don't know, Valentino, when he was on strike, I just want to set it up, Donna, so mm -hmm. people that may not know about it. He went on a tango dance exhibition tour across America with his wife at the time, Natasha Rambova. And correct me if I'm wrong, Donna, they judged beauty contests. And it was all sponsored by Mineral Lava Beauty Products. Right. Um, when he went on strike, and here's a bottle. Ooh, how does they issue those bottles? Um, when he went on strike, of course, uh, Paramount, uh, filed an injunction where he could not act in films, act on stage, or perform. Um, a judge loosened that a little bit uh, in January of 1923. Valentina was approached by a representative of uh, Scott Preparations, which was the parent company for Mineral Lava Beauty Products, to, do, to promote the products and do, go on a dance tour, uh, where he and Natasha would dance. Um, with their own little orchestra and they would promote the products judge a beauty contest and also judge a dance contest and this was set up to uh crisscross the u.s and up in canada and vancouver and toronto and i think montreal um and the caveat was of course they really technically couldn't appear in theaters um so they did them in armories tent shows, you know, ballrooms, all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. And Valentino also appeared on the local radio stations. But when the, when the tour started, um, the preliminary of the tour was in uh, Chicago. They appeared for three weeks at the Trianon Theater. And on my YouTube channel, um, there's a little tiny, I did a little tiny couple of minute documentary on the tour. And it has the only footage that has surfaced of the pair of them dancing. And I believe this originates from Chicago and it's taken from the balcony and you can see the crowd milling below. And it, it's liter literally about 10 or 12 seconds of them dancing. Um, I'll, I'll post a link in the chat if anybody wants to see it. I have also uh, seen on YouTube a documentary where Valentino is judging a beauty pageant. And well, well that's, the, that's the finale at Madison Square Gardens. Once they finished the tour, the tour went from basically March, mid-March until, June of 1923. It was grueling because they, they while they were in a luxury Pullman car, they were doing one night stands all across the United States. Um, so it was exhausting. There were a couple of stops where Natasha did not dance, where there was an understudy dancing with Rudy because she was exhausted. Um, and frankly, who wouldn't have been? I mean, there's a photo of my in my book of um, the pair of them on the, the back of the their Pullman car, and they both look like they're completely exhausted. Um, but the finale was held in November at Madison Square Garden, the old Madison Square Garden, which no longer exists. And uh, there, uh, you know, they had Paul Whiteman was there, 
as musicians, um, oh, an opera singer whose name is escaped me the moment. Uh, so they had acts in between and the beauties were whittled down from 88 to the top five. And um, the third or fourth runner up uh, for which I have the local trophy, this was the Baltimore winner, her name was Mildred Adams. Um, she was like the fourth runner up in the finale. And there's also a picture of the, the four lady or the four, four runners up and, and then the winner, the lady from Toronto uh, in my book. And you can, you can see the difference in the judgment of beauty, you know, between then and now, because no, no one is, you know, terribly skinny but, well, they're not overweight either, but the, you know, they're normal ladies. Um, so where was I going with, with this? So the, um, the finale was um, judged by Valentino and a whole bunch of other people. And there is a, a short film that put David O. Selznick on the map. His, his father, of course, was Louis Selznick, who was a big producer who then went bankrupt. And um, David Selznick had the bright idea of filming the beauty pageant, the final finale is in New York. So they set up cameras all over Madison Square Garden and released this short film, which you can find on YouTube. It's called Rudolph Valentino and his 88 American Beauties. Um, because by that point, Rudy had been off screen for two years. And so, you know, footage of him was, as they said, gold dust. And so they, you know, this short little film played all over the place until Valentino came back making a uh, Monsieur Bocaire. And I love watching it because I love looking at the faces of the women on stage with him. They look so excited and happy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and a couple of them did have um, minor film careers. Miss Los Angeles, while Rudy and Natasha did not judge a dance contest in, in California because of the injunction with Paramount, they, they while they were scheduled to appear in Northern California, they ultimately, this was you know, the only state at the time that they did not tour in because of the injunction. Um, there was a Miss Los Angeles and her name was Eugenia Gilbert and she did make a few comedies, um, but I, she didn't of course become a star, but um, she was pretty much the only one that did have a recognizable film career um, that came out of this whole, whole tour. Um, and then, let's see, I've got a, I've got a bazillion stills, but just too many things to choose from. Um, but one of Rudy's hobbies was he was a photographer. He shot home movies on his films, and he also shot, um, you know, snapshots all over the place. The family, the family has many, 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 many snapshots of his, but I actually have a few. And this is his dog Kabar, oh. in in what I believe is Palm, probably likely Palm Springs. It's not identified on the back. Um, it just says it's Kabar. And I'm, I'm the, the, the little house that he's in front of does is not anything recognizable from Falcon there. So I, um, uh, yeah, it might, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Palm Springs. Um, but then this, this is one of my favorite shots. This is from his camera that he had a friend shoot for him. And this is Rudy on the set of, Four horsemen posing in front of his own grave. Um, and then he had a um, small powerboat, not necessarily a yacht, but it was called the Phoenix. And so he went out on the dinghy, and this is one of his pictures that he shot of his friends and family on the boat. Um, and uh, when he had his famous car accident in January, of 1926 when he came back uh, with his brother but he was he drove up to um oh near Santa Barbara and when he was coming back he um ran into a fence and so he took his um you know he had his camera gear and he took pictures of the wreck of his daughter for skinny um and on the back of one of these it says yeah, I guess it was used for the press. They borrowed it. And it says, please return to our Valentino at 7200 Santa Monica Boulevard, which is where the offices of Rudolph Valentino Productions were. Um, and this is one of my treasures. It's not an uncommon book, Daydreams, his book of poetry. But this particular copy is the one that he gave to his sister, Maria. 
So he brought this with him when he went went and saw her in um, in Rome in 1923. This was uh, after the mineral lavatory. He and Natasha famously went on vacation, and um, you can read a chronicle of it. It was serialized in Movie Weekly magazine. He signed a contract with Bernard McFadden, who published uh, magazines like Physical Culture. Movie Weekly magazine was one of his magazines. He had you know, a dozen magazines and newspapers that he published. Um, so Rudy signed a contract and McFadden published Daydreams and then also serialized his um, Trip Abroad, which was then later published in book form. And when he, um, th there was debate about who actually wrote the poems in Daydreams. Um, but it's my belief that he wrote most of them um, in his downtime and the rarest book that I have is this, and it's um, called Reflections. But what it what this actually is, is a pre-publication proof for copyright purposes. So this three copies of this would have been sent to the copyright office. And um, I know this because this exact book was um, there is a microfilm of it from the Library of Congress, which you know same cover, real mess, long since gone, probably stolen or thrown out. But this copy is um, one that Rudy and Natasha signed to a good friend of theirs in Palm Springs. It was gifted to her. And it's, dear Mrs. Freeman, Natasha and I um, believed you would like to have a copy of this book to help you pass the evenings in Palm Springs, which we so sorely miss. Um, the finished book will be published in a month or so. And it's sent to you with our best wishes and fondest affection. And it's signed by Rudy and Natasha. So I only know of one other copy of this actual proof being extant as far as I know, because um, someone wrote to me years and years ago about it, saying that they had one. Whether in fact they actually did, I don't know. Um, I've had passed through my hand several items that belong to Rudy. I've got a couple of books from his library, which um, don't have an inherent value per se, beyond the fact that they were owned by him because the book plates were produced and plunked in there after he passed away oh. to, um, to promote help sales when they had the estate sale in December of 1926 after he died. Um, but one of my favorite things that I did keep is, um, his pocket knife and it's uh, engraved with his initials and you can't really see it here but you can see the um well it's in it's silver and the the casing on it is silver and you can see where he dug his nails in to hold it to open the blades um so it's one of my favorite little things that i have um, but if any of you go to the memorial that's coming up in August, you August 23rd at 12, 10 p.m. at the Cathedral Mausoleum inside Hollywood Forever, free and open to the public. You will no doubt see treasures from uh, the collection of my friend Tracy Trehune, who I would say is the premier Valentino collector. I mean, he has tons of memorabilia. I mean, personal memorabilia, things that were owned by Valentino. Um, including the, the ring that you see Valentino wear in the Eagle and in stills from a sainted devil um, and in Cobra. It's um, a big, um, I, don't, I don't know if it's silver or platinum. It might be the, the, the ring itself might be platinum and then in, inside is um, a piece of onyx that is carved. Um, Tracy has that and it's beautiful and I have a picture of me wearing it. Um, but he, he usually brings in some wonderful stuff for you to look at. Um, and uh, I, di I didn't pull out uh, any of my signed photos. I've got several signed photos. They're not uncommon, um, but there's one or two of them are in my book. Again, Rudolph Valentino, the silent idol. And mm -hmm. when I post the blog, I will put a, the photo of the cover of the book and a link where people can buy it. Yeah, I mean, and you can't you can buy the the first edition, but I have to say, as nice as it is, because it is full color, um, the photos are small. It's expensive because of the publisher. Um, my new edition, which I published in what twenty 
2019. Um, you know, it it's less pretty because it is all black and white, but I felt that I wanted to expand it and also enlarge the photos so that you could actually see them better. Um, and I was very fortunate that I had friends like Tracy and other collectors who let me use items from their collection free of charge. Um, plus, there's a, a lot here that's from my own collection that, you know, photos are my thing and I've been collecting photos for years. Um, and there were a couple that actually got plunked into this book in the manuscript literally three days before I hit the send button. Oh. Um, and so that was exciting that there were a couple that I got to include that, you know, fell into my lap right beforehand. Um, it's a labor of love. It's, I didn't ex expand the essays. They're, they're succinct and to the point on uh, his biography, but it's, it's the photographs that tell the story. And, you know, I was very lucky that the Valentino family let me use some photos, which they didn't let anyone use before. I, I, it was miraculous that I got access and I'm ever so grateful that they let me use photos from their family collection. Um, so, you know, labor of love, fun to do. And thanks for, thanks for plugging it, Carrie. Of course. And Donna, thank you for doing this episode with me today. You've been so patient with me answering my thousands of questions all week long and helping me make this. Not to worry, not to worry. Awesome. Um, and I'm so grateful to be your friend. And I'm so grateful to have this incredible conversation with you about the start. Even though we veered wildly off course from Agnes. <laughs> you know, that's okay. I don't, I don't think she'd mind. And Agnes had a tough life. It's, it's really sad. And you can read more about it, as I mentioned in the uh, book, Dangerous Birds Atop Hollywood Hills. But I think for me, the takeaway is that she was still an actress. She was an artist. She was trying to express herself, trying to work. And I'm just glad that we're honoring her because I think yeah. they all deserve that love. So you can read a fully a, a full chapter in that book about Agnes, but I I do love her and I am gonna go to her grave later today along with Rudy. So I will oh, good. Pay tribute to both of them. I'll tell tell Agnes I said hello. I will. Donna, thank you so much. You're so welcome. It was a pleasure. And did anybody have any questions that we need to let's see answer? Let's see if they do. Let's see if they do. Pull up. Sometimes my, for some reason, sometimes Facebook doesn't pull up the questions. And pull ah, up. Laura, I see Laura's asking about Dorothy Gish. Um, yes, Dorothy had an affair with Louis Calhoun um, for at least 10 years. They toured um, in Life with Father um, for at least a year. Um, and also they did, oh God, he did the film with, um, it was Anna Harding who was cast at the Magnificent Yankee. They, they did actual several um, stage productions together. Um, and when he was in Hollywood doing something in the, oh, and it may have been, may have been when she was here uh, or here in Hollywood doing um, When Our Hearts Were Young and Gay and Centennial Summer, which was been 1945, they were living at the Garden of Allah together. Because it's meant that that's mentioned in Sheila Graham's autobiography, as I recall. Um, People want so, to know if you're coming down for the memorial. I was initially planning to, but I think I'm probably not going to with the uh, latest, uh, you know, the new variant of COVID. Um, I am immunocompromised, so I'm tr really trying not to travel. And because I'm planning to go to Italy in October. Um, I'm probably not going to be in LA aside from the other fact that it's going to be hotter than three sheets of hell in Los Angeles. Yes. And I, and I don't do heat well. Well, not only that, I just had, I just flew recently and it was a total nightmare and it was extremely stressful. So I think I'm actually canceling a few upcoming plans to go to San Francisco because it was no fun having to deal with airports. Right yeah. Now. Um, all right, and August 23rd at 12, 10 p.m. in the Cathedral Mausoleum is where the Valentino Memorial is gonna take place. And um, I think that's it, but we can always answer questions in the comments and writing later on. Yeah. Well, Donna, thank you so much for Thanks, joining Carrie. Me today. And please keep tuning in. By the way, I do have a Patreon account and any little bit helps me buy ingredients, helps me buy supplies. So I will post the link for that. And thank you all so much for joining me. Please stay tuned.
for more food fun and film history. From yep, and I and I recommend this mousse. It was easy to make and it's tasty. Yes, I agree. I'm probably going to eat some more when we log off. So. All right. Take care, Carrie. Thanks for having me. It was All a pleasure. Right. Thank you.